Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jayo, Senior Director of Arts and Culture. I hope you had a chance to watch the incandescent film House of Hummingbird this weekend. And we are thrilled to have a chance to talk with Pora Kim, the writer and director of this film. Pora Kim graduated from Dongguk University with a degree in film and holds an MFA in film directing from Columbia University. Her short film, the Recorder Exam won numerous awards, including the Best Student Filmmaker Award from the Directors Guild of America, and also a national finalist for the 2012 Student Academy Awards. Her first feature length film, House of Hummingbird, has collected 59 awards from prestigious film festivals around the world, including Berlin Tribeca Film Festival and a Blue Dragon Award, Korea's equivalent of an Oscar. Bora is joining us live from Seoul, Korea. Welcome to the Korea Society, Bora, especially so early in the morning for you. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you all. Thank you for inviting me and I'm very happy to have a conversation with you guys. We are, we are thrilled to have you. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions to Bora via Twitter at Korea Society Art or email arts and culture at koreasociety.org. So Bora, as I mentioned earlier, House of Hummingbird is your first feature length film. What people may not know is that your short film, A Recorder Exam, also featured a little girl, a nine year old, I think, who was named Unhi. And the father in the short film is also played by the same actor in the House mm -hmm. of Hummingbird. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you are Unhi's age and you're probably an eighth grader in 1994. Um, is it fair to assume that House of Hummingbird is at least semi-autobiographical? Or are you uh, tired of that question? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not tired. Actually, I take it as a good question because um, actually it's, it, it is a fiction uh, in the end. Like, of course, like some of the setting, family setting, like my fa family really ran the uh, rice cake house and also yeah family dynamic is true and a lot of like emotions uh that are in the film are mine I think like it, it was it was true to the feelings that I went through when I was teenager but then like a lot of most of episodes and scenes and like what happened in the films are fictional but then but then like people took it as real Get so weird and then they even asked question oh I'm really sorry about Youngji teacher's death <laughs> to me after Q&A and I was like oh I'm sorry but it didn't happen <laughs> like I did I actually felt guilty about like breaking their fantasy um but yeah but I took it as as a compliment because they took it so weird and like mm. it felt weird the film felt so weird real but, yeah yeah but of course it's it's not like a totally 100% autobiographical story, but like it is, it felt like um, I was, I, I shared with audiences um, the emotion, like very deepest emotion and all the fear and like, like longing to be loved and longing to love well. And that's sort of like a uh, fundamental emotion that I deeply went through back then it's all there in the film. So I would say it's not like what I would it, I would say it's like a it's like a mixed. It's mixed, but like in the end, as a filmmaker, even if you use your own memories, you that's like a, there are edited memories. It's not real. I mean, there's no reality. It's like because you see the see the reality in your lens. So it's not. Like the true, there's no true reality. So you edit the reality and you make scene and you have to make climax and you structure everything and then you delete and you re-edit it. And like this sort of process is our fictional process, fictional creative process in the end. So if I, if I have to answer the question in the beginning, that felt like my story. Some of the some of the parts are so weird to me, but now I see it as a fictional story. Yeah, mm, makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the Korean title of the film is Polse, which is mm-hmm. means hummingbird, and mm-hmm. I'm assuming that you're referring to Unhi as mm-hmm. um, with the title. Several viewers have already asked, "Why did you title your film Hummingbird? What does that mean to you, and what does the title means?" Mm-hmm. So hummingbird is the smallest bird in the world, and like it, it um, moves the wing. Uh, 90, 80 times per second. And it flies the very longest distance. Um, although it's very so small and it flies long distance to find honey. And hummingbirds symbolize like love, hope, and like endless searching. And I mm. think that searching really reminds me of Uni's journey in the film. So I thought hummingbird it could be a good title but if i say hummingbird in korean um it sounds really beautiful but for mm-hmm. some reason hummingbird in english sounded like a fancy shop like uh, like <laughs> name of fancy shop like a, like that, a trendy shop like, in Seoul yeah, or something yeah yeah so um that doesn't make sense so i i put house of hummingbird and and i thought it 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 would sound better because this film really is about the family dynamic of Uni. So House of Hum- we, we made it into House of Hummingbird for English title. Yeah. Great choice. Um, let's talk a little bit about the film itself. And um, you chose a very specific location in Seoul in this film, that is mm-hmm. Taechidong, which mm-hmm. signifies so many things to Koreans, but so for non-Korean audience members, I want to just explain very quickly what Techidong yeah. is even. Yes. Um, it is one of the most expensive residence area per square feet in of already very expensive city. Um, the district is known to have sort of the best high schools. Um, it is also the center of the, what is known as the private education industry, which and by private education, I don't mean private schools in American sense. I mean um, the educations that students get outside of the regular school system. So for example, cram schools and tutoring, and it is Techidong is known as the center. Um, and therefore, um, if there's one location that sort of epitomizes the Koreans zeal for education, and in a sense, um, the upward mobility, it is Techidong. That's what Techidong signifies to a lot of people. Um, the Techidong you capture in your mm-hmm. film is sort of at the cusp or at the very early stage of all that is to come. It is also a very particular time in South Korean history as well. It's in between the 80s with all the democratic movement and Olympics and all the turmoils. And it's before the financial crisis of 1997, um, which the Koreans um, refer to as the IMF crisis. So what does that period mean to you, other than you were a teenager and you were growing up in Korea at the time? And what were you trying to capture in this film about that period and that location? Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, Daechidong indeed was a symbol of like westernized westernized, highly westernized area in Korea, like much earlier than any other area, which means uh, when I grew up, the like the norm, social norm in Daechidong was uh, earn more money and being more pretty. And, uh, you know, like elementary kids would ask to each other, what's your father's job? What's your car? What's your father's car? And then they kind of measure each other, like which is really sad. Mm. And I had to go through it. And so actually, since I was, I grew up in that neighborhood, which was very, very extreme. Um, I think I was able to talk, uh, think about what it means to be a human being and what's the, what's the really, um, what's the life value that I really want to have in my life. Um, and I, I back uh, looking back, I'm, I think I was fortunate enough to have that experience in very early age, so that I was able to have, you know, humane and like fundamental, um, like like meaningful way of life through that sort of 
turmoil, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and also that you don't like people, Western audience wouldn't understand that you don't was a uh, rich area because uh, the apartment complex that Uni leaves looked like a project apartment. Mm -hmm. but apartment complex, the huge apartment complex that a lot of people live together is like actually a very preferred uh, living style in Korea. So everyone wants to live in a apartment complex. That's like the one thing that's very unique about living in Seoul, especially. So like, grew, up, grew, grew, up, grew up in an uh, apartment complex, I was able to see a lot of people. And then, you know, like, I was just curious as a kid why people are always chasing something that are, they're not real. Like, mm. I felt very frustrated. Like, it was almost like um, to die or to leave the problem to me. So I started to meditate um, since I was 18 because <clears throat> that was actually a way of faith for me to like survive from this, from this sort of area. And then uh, the reason that I chose 1994 was because I see this film as in its coming of age story, but, at this, uh, but also South Korea's coming of age story. My country was also back then growing, having this growing pain. We wanted to be a developed country, and we had we just had a few years late, few years ago, 1980-80 uh, Seoul Olympics before 1994. So we are very, very happy and like excited about being recognized by those by the whole world. And I think the way in he like like, like the same way that Uni tries to get loved by parents and everyone around her. My country was also in that emotional, like sort of collective emotional state that they want to get some approval and recognition. So we built everything so fast without thinking about human being. And then 1994, Songsu Bridge collapsed. And then 1995, very, very huge department store, Sampung department store Sampung. collapsed. Yeah, within two years, we lost so many people and it was such a tragic event. Um, I heard from my friends in New York, they said their life, it was so much different after 911. You grew up after 911. Like, it's like, it, it's inevitable that you had to grow up after that accident. And mm -hmm. we grew up after Songsu Bridge collapse. And it was such a, such a like painful memory. And I remember I was like looking through photos of Songsu Bridge collapse while I was working on uh, this film. And then just looking at the photo of the collapsed bridge made me suffer. Like, like I, I was able to like sense this bodily sensation that mm -hmm. I felt deeply pain. So, um, yeah. So I wanted to deal with that sort of collective trauma, uh, making connection uh, with this main character Uni's collapse because Uni is also uh, facing collapse in every field of her life, school, uh, society, family, and her friends and lover and everything. So I thought that parallel between the two would be very, very um, like meaningful to talk about broader um, co uh, collective <clears throat> trauma uh, by talking about this little girl's coming of age. Yeah. I think that makes perfect sense. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Uni's family, the mm -hmm. dynamic among Uni's family members, whether it's the relationship between the husband and wife or father and son mm -hmm. and father and daughter and mother and daughter and siblings. Each one seems to have enough drama to be a film on its own, almost. Mm -hmm. And it is so easy to say, oh, it is a depiction of a patriarchy and domestic violence. But what I really appreciate in your film is that you don't necessarily depict any of them as evil. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, um, they are all 
three-dimensional characters. Not that that excuses their action, but mm -hmm. we do mm -hmm. see different sides of each one of them. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you decide to depict this particular family mm -hmm. and the choices you made as a writer and filmmaker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made a really good point. Um, actually, a lot of audiences <clears throat> in Korea, after watching House of Hummingbird, they would say, oh, Uni's family is, it looked like a normal, very regular family back then in 90s. Mm -hmm. And they, the, the, the reason that they looked like normal, normal family, it's very important because I wanted to depict no more, but very, very inhumane family. Because I think um, cruelty happens in no more family, I think, everywhere. I'm not just talking about a uh, Korean family. Our seemingly uh, looking no more family has own trauma, demon, and like, like problems that they don't talk about uh, to anybody. Um, because they're shame, they they're, they feel shame. Mm. So I wanted to deal with that sort of regular <laughs> no more um, uh, problem that we had to deal with, um, and I wanted to say that wasn't no more. That wasn't no more. That wasn't that that was very very um, violent. Yeah, uh, what, I wanted to, yeah. Mm -hmm. What no people may accept as normality. Yeah, there's actually a problems with it there's actually yeah. an issue with it and that we should deal yeah. with it yeah yeah um, like back then in 90s like you oh go ahead what, no, what go ahead you yeah no, you were go ahead the way but, that the way that the kids had to go through in school like like you have to go to source university and then in family like there's a uh, dynamic power dynamic um the power dynamic is much more um important than love and like like you don't really get loved the way by the by the way that who you just who you are um and that is not normal and i wanted to depict that like um and people really liked it because of that because these characters are not evil these characters are not not like kidnapper or rapist or anything like i wanted to depict that sort of um, mundane violence in um, everyday lives because seemingly mundane violence are the, the, the most critical violence that we overlook, but like we, we remember and the body keeps the score and, and that really remained as collective trauma, I think. And I wanted to bring that issue to the film because a lot of Korean films, um, but especially by male, male directors, they deal with like such an extreme violence, like mm. rape, sexual assault, and like so, like very, very extreme killing and violence. But that's so cinematic to me, I think. I mean, I'm not judging that sort of films are bad or something, but like, you know, I, I thought there has to be films that also deal with daily lives, yeah. And you certainly do. And one of the most striking scene um, from the film, which is filled with a lot of them, uh, was when Unhi is in the hospital mm -hmm. and she's sort of sharing the room with a number of older women. Mm -hmm. And there's this real sense of warmth and this sense of this woman really like care for her, even though they don't know who she really is. And mm -hmm. um, there's, um, and that's when it really hits the audience that, that this sense of very little kindness, sort of that mm -hmm. grace um, was so lacking in her own family um, in mm -hmm. contrast. And of mm -hmm. course, the most positive influence in Annie's life comes from outside of family. And that is her relationship with the teacher, um, Youngji. Mm -hmm. um, when we think of Korean culture, as you said, the importance of family is almost paramount. Mm -hmm. Everybody sort of emphasizes the, the relationship between the family as a foundation of culture. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to have a slightly different take on that. Um, what were you trying to say, especially with Unyi's 
um, relationship with people, especially the adults outside mm-hmm. of her family and mm-hmm. how she seems to be really raised by those little graces from strangers. Mm-hmm. I see. I think um, I always would sort of say to people or to journalists when it comes to this film, like I would say, uh, a bio, bio, biological family is not important. Like love is important. Like mm-hmm. when you can love each other, you can call them as family. And I still think that way. Um, so I wanted to depict that, like that sort of, I would say stupidity that people just believe that bio, biological, like blood is the most important factor in family and like, if everyone is like linked with the blood, then then they think it's family. No, that's not like so. I I was I thought about it a lot when I was younger, and then um, I was able to meet like so many so many uh, great great people in my life outside of family, and then that actually that these sort of elements was a, a very true to my own story. And then I wanted to capture that sort of encounter that that you can have um, in your life that um, like everyone around you could be your extended family. But then I think I wanted to also depict Uni. Um, uh, she has this wonderful uh, relationship with the Youngji teacher and people around her in the hospital or the small clinic doctor or anything or uh, people like anyway who are uh, kind to her through that love Uni was able to also see her family also loves her in a way not in a way that she really wants or maybe the way her family share with her might be looking very mature but there is love. And then in the end, Uni realized that. And actually, um, personally, after, like during, uh, while I was working on this film, like I was able to really um, uh, have like, a deep, deep conversation with my family. And then actually after, uh, since I was uh, meditating, uh, uh, like from very early age, I was able to, have peace with my family. And then it was, I think like working on this film and the short film, the recorder exam in a row, um, it was it was very, very um, blissful process because like you actually, um, you, you kind of like don't understand, cannot understand family because you are so emotionally attached to them, attached to them. But then like, <clears throat> while I was working on the sh- short film, a lady, the record exam, I started to see my family as character. I was approaching them as if I'm studying character analysis. And then what happened it was, <clears throat> was kind of magical because since you have this healthy distance and like see them as character, you got to understand them more as human beings, not as parents or not as family members that you have such a longing. Um, so I was able to have such a great um, conversation with them and they supported me throughout all this process. And then now I see them as my true family because there's love. But then it took so many years, but it was it was worth it. And then that was very important uh, process because I felt that if I don't have um, love in my life and with the, all the past that I went through, the emotions and the, the fear and the, the resentment and all that, like I wanted to really, really have some peace and closer so that I can have healthy distance and make this story as collective story, not as my story with this so much narcissism or ego attached. So that was very, very uh, difficult process uh, until even before I started to write first draft 
So that's why I call it as fiction or story in the end, I think. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like uh, writing was almost a therapy for you. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. It was yeah. very worth it. Yeah. I and think I got the gifts even before the film was released. Yeah. And I think what you just mentioned, um, which I think is really important, that sort of at the end when he starts to see the love from her parents, I think the scene that sort of, exemplifies that is that scene where her mother's um, making her the is it like potato pancakes or something and mm -hmm. she doesn't it, it seems like she doesn't know what had happened she doesn't know what when he had just went through um, but she's making it for her and she presents it to her and she's eating it and she's the mom's just looking at her almost without you know, words, it seems like mm -hmm. finally she's seeing her daughter and understanding mm -hmm. yeah, her, yeah. which was, it was just such a beautiful scene. But also I wanted to ask you about this idea of sharing meals. Um, mm -hmm. The family, when they actually talk to each other without screaming at each other, it seems like mm -hmm. is when they actually sit down and mm -hmm. share a meal. Um, this importance of I guess, sharing a meal. Mm -hmm. And we always kind of joke that why is that in K-dramas, they are always eating. <laughs> um, there seems to be like, I mean, Koreans, you know, of course they have to eat, but it seems like there's always this sense of this collective sharing of meals means something. What does that mean to you as a director? I think uh, Asian people really love to eat first. <laughs> and I, in Korea, we, we have this saying that uh, in the U.S., you you ask to people like, how, how are you? How have you been? Like, what's up? Like, what are you up to? But we say, did you eat lunch? Did you eat dinner? That's how we greet each other. And I think people really um, tend to think eating is important for some reason. <laughs> and my family was like that, too. And I, most of families are like that. Like they really think it's important to have meals together. And I, I also like have that sort of very, very warm memories that even if we don't talk to each other, there are days that we don't talk to each other, but we anyway share meals. And I wanted to have that like sort of uh, meaning throughout the film because Uni feels very lonely and isolated. Then she eats like potato pancake as if like she's so, so hungry. Um, and then the eating and the, like I think Uni feels like this emotional hunger and the emotional hunger is very related to like the sense of belonging and love and all that. And so I wanted to bring that sort of a lot of complex meaning of the activity eating and so in the in the film eating is not just eating it's it's much more than that so and in the end not finally when <laughs> he is able to have potato pancake with her mom and like what you said that that was the first moment the mom really looks at her with the because like throughout the film she's always showing her back or like a three-quarter profile and then that was the first shot that her mom looks at her very long time. And I actually like extended the duration of the close-up than average close-up, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's go back to the character of Youngji for a second. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the teacher the, uh, that with whom and he has such a very special relationship. Um, it is never really spelled out or spoken out in the film but there are enough clues for the, at least the Korean audience to know who she is and sort of fill in the blanks. Um, but perhaps not for the non-Korean audience because we actually got a few questions asking what is the backstory of Youngji? Um, and then I guess, I guess what I wanted to ask you is I'm sure you made this deliberate choice not to go into the backstory of Youngji for uh, various reasons, but also because maybe because you knew that the Korean audience would probably understand where she comes from. Um, mm -hmm. when, but then when the film's 
is shown outside of Korea. Did it surprise you that people would have come up with different ideas about who she really is? And did that worry you or does it really matter? Because I mean, basically what matters is the relationship between Yang Ji mm-hmm. and Eun Hee. Mm-hmm. And by the way, um, I hope I'm right in saying that um, Yang Ji is what we call Undongguan, which means mm-hmm. student protesters. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why she you know, left university and that's why she's kind of floating around it seems like mm-hmm. and sometimes she disappears and all that and there mm-hmm. again as i said there are enough cultural cues in the film for koreans to implicitly understand where she mm-hmm. comes from but did that worry you a little that people will not get that sense or does that matter well it didn't really uh matter whether international audience would get that or not but like of course it would be much better if they get it so when i was when i showed this film in hong kong there was like a lot of protests back then like le- last year especially and then people got it like they got it uh, uh young ji was student protester and like the way the the reason that they they even got it the reason why Youngji disappeared they kind of assumed that she was in jail or something so I think a country that went through similar um, like political situation would have much better understanding but even if they don't it's it doesn't matter because I didn't really want to focus and highlight the background because, you know, in Korea, there are so many films about student protester in 80s and 90s. And I kind of felt that that's too much. And I didn't want to make Youngji as conventional student <laughs> protester. Um, so that's why I kind of like make it as this really vague background. But, you know, you can see it through her bookcases. Um, you can see this title of feminism and communism books and all that. And so she, she's all like apparently a feminist big time and she reads like communism books and all that. Um, but like audience doesn't have to, they, they don't have to understand fully, but you know, even if they don't understand and they don't know about the background, they can understand she is very liberal radical person and like looking like a total big time feminist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Speaking of which, the film is set in a very, as we mentioned, very specific time period, 1994. Um, Yet there is this sense of timelessness. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of films that deal with our recent past seems to design to provoke sort of Mm -hmm. certain nostalgia by emphasizing things we don't use anymore, like pay phones and pagers. Mm. And um, some of our viewers actually mentioned, very fondly mentioned um, the Benetton backpack, yeah. <laughs> um, the brand Michigo London, which yeah, you know, yeah. if you lived in Korea during that time, they all mm-hmm. instantly recognize. Mm-hmm. But as a f- director, it's not like you kind of zoom in on those details and go like, yeah. look what I, you know, look what I found. Mm-hmm. Here it is, remember this? Um, it's just very natural. Um, yeah. And also your use of lighting um, mm-hmm. gives the, this whole film that sense of timelessness, um, I mm-hmm. think. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us about certain choices you made during the pre-production mm-hmm. and how you are going to approach this uh, period, periodicity, I guess? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, h- how much did you want to emphasize that this is story from 94 versus obviously there are so many things that is timeless and universal. Mm-hmm. Well, you understood very well uh, the intention that I had uh, in terms of pro- uh, production design and all that, because that was my intention that I wanted to have timelessness and nowness than just like showing, oh, this is cute, uh, like period film that shows like cute and like nostalgic uh, props. That wasn't my intention. And also we, our film was such a low budget, like we couldn't create all the reality as we wanted to. So I chose the, a very intentional decision that we can create the 90s uh, just by highlighting very, very specific uh, pivotal props, such as the yellow Benetton bag and like pay, pager and uh, some sort of like 90s books about communism and also the, the song that Youngji sing and uh, some, some sort of like 
very famous Korean song in the karaoke. Uh, and also like the, the, the apartment design, house, house decoration, um, like which is very wooden and like uh, naturalistic lighting and all that. Uh, so we just wanted to bring some sort of very, very uh, like a broad 90s looking, but like just highlight that sort of thing here and there, but not everything, because I wanted to have um, universality, like no matter where you live, which country you grew up, I wanted to, I wanted to, for audience to feel that that's their story as well. To make that happen, you shouldn't, I, I, will, I realize that I don't have to highlight too many, too much of Korean, um, like, specificity. So I purposely chose that this film should be uh, about Korea's history, but at the same time, universal story. So I try not to show all the details of 90s, but like some highlights for, for many reasons, but like mostly budget and also um, the, 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 the intention that I wanted to bring that periodness so that uh, timelessness so that um, you can have much more uh, interaction with more broader audiences and also mm. bring uh, the theme that this is still happening. This is not just past. We are still going through this. Uh, not that extreme, but everywhere around the world, they are still suffering from lack of love and they still want to get like a belong somewhere but um, a lot of countries have this issue that they have this sort of social norm that are not really humane and I wanted to capture that we are still having that problems yeah and speaking of the songs you just mentioned um, a, a few Viewers also mentioned the use of silence versus music. Mm -hmm. um, the choice of when to include music and which mm -hmm. music you decide to include. Um, mm -hmm. Because, it, you know, a coming of age story, uh, sometimes, you know, there's that Hollywood cliche or any, you know, sort of the cliche of using music to sort of punch up the emotion. There's, um, you know, the sort of the swelling music comes mm -hmm. and you know you're supposed to feel a certain way. I don't think you do that in this film. And mm -hmm. the, the, it's the, the music that is used is almost like a sound. It's very mm -hmm. um, sort of in the back. But then mm -hmm. there are specific scenes where music is very much out there, um, mm -hmm. especially the dance scenes, yeah, uh, whether yeah. it's the father dancing mm -hmm. or um, when Unhi is dancing by herself, which really struck me because it's not necessarily a song a little girl would dance to. It's like mm -hmm. basically like her father's music mm -hmm. that she's dancing mm -hmm. to. And then of course the song Youngji sings to girls, which, um, which is also different because I wouldn't, Think that that's kind of the song you would find at like a karaoke bar. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a very specific song. Um, mm -hmm. So can you um, tell us a little bit about how you decided when and what kind of music to use mm -hmm. in your film? Yeah, um, like what you said, um, I wanted to have silence throughout the film. Like, uh, and then I, I wanted to uh, have music as if it's like an ambient sound, not just like uh, music that like says, oh, hello, I'm here. Like, so I, I had a conversation with my composer and he did a great job and I'm so happy with the music. Every time I hear the ending credit music, I, I feel like crying. Maybe I'm, I feel like crying because it's, I'm, I, it, it kind of reminds me of the, the feeling that I finished editing. Um, editing process took a year, by the way. Uh, anyway, um, so we, my composer and we had a conversation how much music should you, appear and when and when not to, that was very in, important decision because there are scenes that we wanted to have music, but then like it was too emotional. So we had to remove certain music that he already made. Um, 
so that we could really focus on in his feeling in his emotions because you sometimes um have more breathing room when there's nothing when there's only like ambient sound or silence so like we had to uh make choices um, between like a scenes that we wanted to really have music and also that scenes that should bring a lot of emotion, but not through music, but through her acting or through the silence. So it was very in uh, intense conversation, like when not to, when to, and also other music that are already, that are that existed already, like the dance song, that bother dancing song, so song and like the, the young, the teacher Youngji song. That that's actually what 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 Youngji sing is a protest protester right. song. So it was very famous, well known protester song in eighties and nineties. So if you sing the song, pe people know that she's like student right. protester. Uh, but like if you are into that sort of field, not everyone recognize it. But people would guess that that's right. not the like like pop song or anything, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So I wanted to just bring like uh, this sort of ambient music and also this like 90s, uh, like funky music so that we can have this balance between these two and the choices, uh, choice of the dancing scene, uh, the father uh, dances based on this like funky 90s song and then Uni dance uh, based on the song later on was the choice was made by my producer and editor Zoe she actually just put the music later there was actually no music in in the beginning but then she just put it and then she was just asking oh I just put it um, to see and then it works really well. and then I was very surprised and it makes sense so we just wanted to have these two moments of dancing um, father between father and daughter and they kind of share similar emotions and while we watch the dance scene of Uni you kind of understand finally what kind of emotion the father went through in the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right and speaking of Uni I think we have to talk about the extraordinary actress um, Jiho Park um, who is, seems like she's in like pretty much every single scene in the film and really carries the film. Um, I believe it was her first acting, was it her first acting job or? Um, no, she acted before, but this is okay. first, her first major role because oh. she did like small roles for like commercial film. I before. see. Yeah. So how did you find her and what was that, what was your process of directing such young actress when she's going through so many different emotions in the film. Mm -hmm. And you actually have a lot of young actors in yeah. the film. And they all, again, as I said, you know, each family member seems to have their own drama. Like Young Ji's, uh, uh, Unhee's friends, they all seems to have their own dramas happening in their lives too. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you find her and how did you approach directing such young actors? Um, well, we found them through a cast, uh, audition and also like through like watching like others film. And so it was very just normal audition process, but like I was uh, trying to really find uniqueness when I have these auditions with kids, uh, ch children because I tried to find like uh, like children actress who are very like like not not looking like actor like not trained actor because I like I almost wanted to have this film as if it's like almost like documentary so we purposely found uh, teenager actors that are not trained and they didn't that did, uh, who didn't really act it before. So the, the Uni's boyfriend, he, he acted almost for the first time. And in terms of Uni, um, we auditioned, auditioned her, but I realized that she was very, very close to character Uni in her real life. Um, because Jihu, her name is Jihu, she's very, very clear about what she wants. And she's not afraid of like what really 
what really she feels. Uh, for example, after the first audition, uh, she we ended the audition and like I just bowed to her. Oh, bye. It was great meeting you. And she kind of looked back at me right in front of the door and said, Director Borakin, I am very charming the more you see me. So please call me back for next audition. That was what she said. And I was very, very fascinated by her approach because like I was looking for a character who's very, very um, like determined and like Jiu looked so determined and like very clear about transparent about what she wants. And I like that because, you know, you came to audition and you want to be uh, the, the main actress. That's, that's what you really desire for. Then like you can be very honest about it. And she was very honest and very, very thoughtful and like authentic about what she feels throughout the whole, whole journey. And I just loved her as a person and then as an actress. And the reason that she, she and I, uh, she uh, and also the acting process between me and her was very, very, um, I don't know, personal because we like, we had a lot of conversation, not about the character, but about her life. And I would ask a lot of questions to her. So be even before we shoot the film, like for the six months, we just hung out together and like we would go to cafe, cafe and brunch and like one that one day she came over to my place and slept over and like we just had a um, conversation and like kind of like close relationship as people first so that we we could have this like trust before the shoot and I just I think it's very important for teenager actors to believe that I trust them because they're minorities. They're, they lean on their parents, they lean on others. So they, they actually study a lot of people. They study because they feel very vulnerable. Because, because, of, because that they are vulnerable, it's very, very pivotal that you really love and trust them. Not just pretending to, to trust, but like really you need to you need to give them trust. And that if there is a trust and everything just follows naturally. So since we had so, much, so many conversations before the film shoot, like on set, I would only ask her two or three people to questions on set. Like every scene, um, I would ask question to her, what do you want other partner, scene partner to say or do? And where are you coming from? Because we are not shooting in order. So I, all have to, I always have to re remind where we are coming from and what was the last scene? What was the, the scene before? So that she could be immersed into the character. And she was really quick to like be immersed into the scene and she, just acted so weird as if she was in me. Hmm. It's, and she is extraordinary, but what yeah, you right. just described, uh, the relationship you had with the actress chi Park, it almost um, seems to reflect what shows up on screen between the <laughs> relationship between Youngji and Eunhee. Um, we started talking about whether it, uh, the film was autobiographical or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we started thinking maybe Unhee is you, how you used to be. But it almost seems like Youngji is sort of like how you want to be to mm -hmm. at least the younger generation. Like, did that, were you aware of that? Or mm -hmm. did you see yourself in the role of Youngji? Or is that something you wanted when you were, um, in his age? Well, I, I think filmmaker, I always have like a one like a character that they feel very related to. I think Uni and Youngji are the two most important and like characters that I feel related to. Um, and I think I wanted to put my voices through Youngji's voice, of course. Um, and I think we all need a Youngji teacher and we all need to be, I think, a Youngji. Um, 
Uh, where Youngji is not perfect. Actually, the reason I like Youngji is she's not perfect. She hates herself sometimes, and she knows it. She's aware of it, and she's just trying to grow. As if uh, same in the same way that you know, Uni wants to grow. Um, but at least Youngji is trying to be aware of who she is instead of faking who she is. Um, yeah, so, but then like while I was working on the screenplay, I wasn't like thinking like very deeply about like, oh, this is like what I want to share with the world. But I just wrote it just naturally. And then later after I, I'm, I was done with the screenplay, I realized that, oh, this is maybe the voices that I wanted to have when I was younger. Like I, I wished there was like a teachers like that. And actually I was fortunate enough to have this sort of teachers like Youngji when I was growing up. Like, uh, so I, I would say Youngji is a character that, that, that has everything, every good things of people that I met throughout my life. And like little by little, piece by piece of people that I love, yeah. Someone just asked, um that the scene, uh, this viewer's favorite scene was uh, um, when the teacher tells Uni that she, f when she feels discouraged, she should just look at her hands and marvel mm -hmm. at the fact that you have them and that they move um, mm -hmm. and ask if that came from your meditation practice, sort of that awareness. Uh, of, I see. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yes. And like, I remember like there was like Preacher Times magazine or something in the US. I think it's their like a meditation journal, like a magazine or something. And then they said House of Hummingbird is very spiritual film. And I, I took it as a really good compliment because, you know, uh, uh, some I still I'm not meditating <laughs> enough. Sometimes I am like really, really like uh, uh, distracted by all the emotions sometimes. And like, but then I try to be very meditative of most, most, most of my days. But, but then like this film becomes like very spiritual meditative film, like based on people's reaction. And I was very happy and like uh, fulfilled because I realized that um, I didn't really intend to have this spiritual thing in my film. Like it just happened naturally. But then like, since I had that, have had this lives that I really wanted to be meditative throughout my life. And like that sort of philosophy and life value and what I learned throughout my life, like kind of like, Mm, pervaded this film uh, into the film. And that was very uh, surprising and beautiful, I think. Of course, I have this intention, the dialogue, uh, what Youngji says, I hoped she wouldn't say anything that are very, very um, vague, uh, no, 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 conventional. Uh, so I was like looking really hard, like I was thinking really hard what she should say. And then I thought about what I heard from meditation. Uh, like meditation is all about, all about seeing who you are as it is and like seeing the moments as, it, as they are. And like you don't deny, you just accept and just look at it as it is. That's very important. And I also made this film like as what happened in the 90s, instead of denying, instead of sugarcoating. Uh, so that actually lines were very important. And like, that's the, the theme that I wanted to have throughout my film. And speaking of historical events, because obviously the Songsu Bridge collapse is a huge mm -hmm. part of this film. I don't think, uh, Tell us a little bit about timeline, because obviously you would think that Korea had enough with the collapse of Songsu Bridge and Sampung Bakajun, but then a few years ago we had even bigger disaster. I mean, to call it bigger disaster, but different type of disaster that is the sinking of the Seoul Ho, and in which so many young people perished. Um, 
there are a lot of questions people asking if when you are making the film, is that what you're thinking? I think you probably wrote it before this whole yeah, disaster, before. but it is inevitable, inevitable for the viewers to sort of be reminded of mm -hmm. that disaster. Um, yeah. Are you, were you thinking of it or did it just come together at the end after you finished the film? Um, I wrote it before the disaster, but people remind of, remind of the, the disaster while watching the film. I think it's just life goes on and on and like have this uh, cycle of what's happening, like similar events throughout the history. Mm, yeah, so I, I just like felt like I'm having this deja vu. Uh, we are having, we are going through similar events and we don't really reflect and like make same mistakes. And that felt very, I don't know, painful. Yeah, and a lot of Korean audiences, um, like they kind of see ending scene as some sort of symbol of the disaster. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say I didn't really intend to because it was, the script was written before the disaster. And then by the end of the film, then he has experienced, as you said, all forms of love or lack thereof. Um, some of them are fleeting and some of them are passionate and confusing and tragic. Um, and one of the viewers asked this question, which I thought was really lovely. Um, what do you think in his understanding of love at the end of the film? Mm. I think you kind of answered it a little bit when you talked about mm -hmm accepting the um, parents as individuals. But what do you think in, in his mind, um, love means at the end? Well, a lot of audiences like come to me and like, <clears throat> like blame me. Why did you kill Youngzi teacher? <laughs> Youngzi teacher became like huge uh, character, especially in Korea. They just loved the, the character a lot. And like, they blamed me. Like, why did you kill her? But I had to cure her. Like I had to make her disappear uh, in Uni's journey so that Uni can grow by herself. I mean, I, I know I sound very cruel, but like it's like a like the mythology. You you meet like wise person through your journey in your journey on, on, uh, throughout the journey, and then you learn something, and the wise men leave. Uh, and then so you learn uh, as if that's your own lesson. You're absorbing the, the, guy, the, the, the person's lesson and you move on. And I wanted to have that sort of structure, uh, hero's journey structure. And so in the end, Uni is left alone, but she grows, grows and compared to the opening scene. The, so like as a filmmaker, you have to really think about what kind of opening scene, ending scene, you should have and like there's like there has to be some change and uh, character like uh, structure and character should learn something and in the in the opening scene like you can see the face of Uni that that are like filled with fear and like like uh, lack of love and then in the end her close-up through her close-up you can see and realize that Uni grows and she will move on no no matter what and like there must be things that are hard to her even in the future but you have this sense of feeling that she would deal with it well and she learned something after Youngju's death yeah. mm. um so since you started a new story with the recorder exam and continued with house of hummingbird many people are demanding that you continue the story of an mm -hmm. um most famously, um, uh, the famous director, uh, Park chan -wook, um wrote this thing about, you must make the sequel. Um, <laughs> is that your plan or have you moved on? Uh, I, I have moved on. <laughs> and I'm actually working on sci-fi film and right. it, it is like studio film. Uh, so it's like a different genre and different budget. And I intended to have studio film after this film because 
Well, I just wanted to challenge myself as a director. And also I, I, I think I'm done with Unhi's story. And I yeah. think I'm very happy that it, there's a closer to me. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I think we can ask you on and on and on about Unhi. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now. <laughs> so thanks again, Bora. Um, we wish you all the best with your second film and everything else, um, stay healthy. And if you missed it, um, the Korea Society streaming of House of Hummingbird, it is available on various virtual theaters and streaming services. Special thanks to Peter, our IT director for making this live webcast a possibility. And to our interns, Jia and Hiju for getting all the questions and doing email outreach and social media postings. And of course, our thanks to you, our members and viewers. We hope you'll join us again. Check out what's coming up on the, our website, koreasociety.org, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks. Good night. Thank you so much, Bora. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks.